about erasure coding, but the history of error detection and correction and how that led to erasure coding. So thank you for coming. Um, and it's not working anymore. Hmm. One second. Okay, there we go. Nice. Cool. So, who am I? So, my name is Danny, and I work for Softiron in the UK, where we're working on building a Ceph appliance. I've mainly worked for open source companies in the past, so companies like Linbit and CodeThink, and I run a nonprofit in the UK called Open Source Events, where we do tech meetups and conferences, mainly around OpenStack and Cloud Native. Um, and yeah, I like beer. Um, so I mainly got interested in this topic a few years ago after I saw a colleague called Jim MacArthur do a, t a lightning talk on error correction. And so I wondered how this relates to RAID and other storage technologies. And I did some digging and figured out there's lots of ways to do this. And I thought I'd provide an overview of some of the ways that um, error correction and detection is done. So the main idea is to have a set of techniques so that when we're transmitting data, we can figure out if... Um, once we've received the data on the other end, it's inconsistent or uh, even better if we can correct the data um, rather than just dropping it. So these concepts have been around since before modern computers were born, but they've come a long way, so even the older ideas are still around in some of our modern technology. So why do we have errors in the first place? Um, it could be human error, it could be network glitches, it could be something more random, such as uh, noise on a chip or cosmic rays interfering with the chip. Um, all of these things can cause us to receive something different or the, the data to send something different. So by a show of hands, how many people have heard of a parity bit? Pretty much the whole room. Cool. So the parity bit is the earliest and most basic form of error detection in computers. And it's a very basic type of checksum. And the idea is that you can add a bit to the end of a set of bits, which let you detect an error when you're transmitting the data. So we do this by adding up the number of one bits we have. And um, if it's an even parity bit, then we make it true for an even number of one bits. And if it's an odd parity bit, we'd make it true for an odd number of bits. So you can see here that in the first uh, character, we have two one bits that we're transmitting, so because that's even, we'll add a one on the end, and we'll send that, and if we receive the same thing on the other side, we know that no error has transmitted. Um, same again with K, an even number of bits, so we add a one on the end, that's the, the one in bold, and if we transmit it and there's an error, or there's a, a different number, you know, we, we can do the calculation on the other side and see that actually we should have a zero. There's obviously some sort of mistake, so we just drop that frame and ask the Whoever, whatever sent it to retransmit it. And same again on the, on the third one, there's another error there, and that's an odd number of bits. That's why the last, the last bit that we're transmitting is a zero. So this concept goes back as far as the 50s, and we had parity tracks appear on mechanical tape drives uh, in the early 50s. Um, the major flaw with this is that if you have more than one error within a byte, we're not going to detect it. So it will only pick up... Um, one bit error. So if there's multiple bits within the same segment, then obviously it's going to be a false positive. It's still very useful though, um, and we use it quite heavily in hardware applications such as microprocessor caches, uh, the PCI and SCSI bus standards, and uh, RS-232 serial, and lots, lots of other hardware applications use it. Um, so that's a very simple way to detect basic errors uh, in transmission, but we can't correct them. Um, there's a decimal equivalent to this, um, and this is used in lots of different real-world applications, like social security cards, ID cards, and all major credit cards. So this is one of my old credit cards or debit cards. And um, you'll, you'll see that the last digit is actually a check digit. So how does this work? Uh, I don't know if you've ever noticed that when you're putting your credit card or debit card number into a web form, it, it might automatically know uh, whether that's valid or not. Even if you're not connected to the Wi-Fi, it's all happening locally. And that's due to this Loon algorithm. 
And so the idea is this guy, he, German, German American engineer, worked for IBM in the 40s and 50s, and he was the first guy that came up with the idea of information buckets to speed up data retrieval and storage. And the idea here is that, uh, that he came up with, with this algorithm is that you double every digit, every other digit starting from the right, and then sum all the digits, and they should be a multiple of 10. And if they're not, then you know that something's wrong. So the last, the last digit will either make it a multiple of 10 or it won't. Cool. So then we get on to um, trying to do some correction. And um, the main, one of the main pioneers here is a guy called Richard Hamming. And he used to, uh, he was a mathematician and professor who worked at Los Alamos um, on the Manhattan Project in 1945. And he was on a team which was responsible for programming the IBM calculating machines, which had the scientists' formulas uh, check that they were correct. And um, a few years later, he went on to join Bell Labs, and he became known to be one of the Young Turks, who was a group of people at Bell Labs that all uh, had heavy contributions to compute science. Um, they were all pretty well respected, and they didn't have... They weren't given the usual uh, responsibilities and structure, uh, you know, but measured by grants and teaching, teaching and papers. They were kind of just left to get on with it. And um, three of them ended up going on to win Nobel Prizes, and a few of them went on to lead Bell Labs. Um, but all of them are highly respected scientists. Uh, John Tukey was w one of the first guys to come up with the name, the, the term bit, which is contracted from binary information digit. Um, so while he was at Bell, um, Richard Hamming set one of his calculating machines to work on a problem over the weekend. He said, well, he said, he said it on Friday. And when he came back on Monday, he discovered that due to uh, an error, um, the whole calculation had died early on Saturday morning, and so he'd have to restart the whole thing again, waste two days of work, or wait till the next weekend. And this was quite common, because you had uh, punch cards, and so if a card was bent or it didn't punch properly, then you know, you, you're going to have an error. So he then basically went on to perform probably the biggest yak shave in history and decided to sack off all that physics nonsense and figure out how to get calculating machines to detect errors and automatically retransmit data identified as inconsistent. So he published this key paper in 1950 called Error Detecting and Error Correcting Codes. And he described a few concepts that are still core to error detection and correction today. And these are, uh, number one is the, the Hamming distance, which just describes how many single bit operations I have to do to correct a uh, binary number or string. So, you know, for FOSTEM 19, FOSTEM 20, there's two characters different. That would be um, two, but obviously on a binary level. Um, this can also be represented geometrically, and it's called the Hamming cube. So he went on to define a system called the Hamming codes, which uh, is far more robust at checking errors than standard parity. And uh, what he developed was the concept of having three parity bits for every four data bits, which is quite expensive. But it means that we can detect errors up to two bits and also correct one bit errors. So how does this work? Let's have a look. So if we have four bits here, D1 to D4, and we want to send them over some sort of transmission channel, we can arrange them at the intersection of three circles. Uh, so one, zero, one, zero. And uh, then we can calculate the parity for each circle. So for the parity circle one, we have one one bit. So that's an odd number. So the parity will be zero. For parity um, for the second circle, we have two one bits. So that's even, so parity is going to be one. Um, for the third circle, we have, again, one parity bit. So that's odd, so that's going to be zero. So we have three parity bits. We add them to uh, our data, and we send that across the channel. Now, on the other side, we receive something different. So we get a D3 is turned to a zero instead of a one. So how do we detect this? Um, in the new circle that we're arranging on the other side. You'll see that D3 switches to zero, and then we'll recalculate starting with the first parity circle. Nothing's changed there. It's still an odd number. Something has changed there. It's now supposed to be an even number of bits, but it's not one bits, but it's not. And the same for parity circle three. So we know that the offending bit is at the intersection of the second and third circles. So therefore, it's D3. And so we can just switch, flip that bit, and correct the error. So that's the basic way that Hamming codes work. Um, so we use parity pretty heavily in RAGE. 
Some of you will be familiar with RAID levels. You probably, you probably haven't come across RAID 2 because nobody uses it, and that, that's because it's really expensive. Uh, but this is Hamming codes, and it happens at the bit level. And so you can see that there's four data blocks and three parity, uh, data bits, sorry, and three parity bits for, um, on, uh, that are striped across these hard drives. Um, so yeah, I've, I don't think anyone uses this. Um, then you have, obviously, I'm sure all of you are familiar with RAID 5. RAID 4 is similar to RAID 5. There's, the only difference is that rather than distributing the parity bits across the drives, we put all the parity bits on one drive. And that means that um, writes are slower with RAID 4 since there's less data drives to write to. Um, but since all the parity is written to the same disk, um, random reads are better. So, sorry, so writes are slower because the parity has to be written to the same disk, but random reads are better because there's less disks for you to look for because you have a dedicated parity disk. So uh, that's, that's RAID 4. This is RAID 5. And you're, you're all familiar with RAID 5, I guess. The way it works is it runs an exclusive OR on the block. So for every two uh, blocks that we write, we run an exclusive OR, and then we write the result as a third block. And so green here is the, is the parity data. So if I keep doing that, and obviously on different drives, I end up with a whole bunch of data. Now if I lose one of the drives, I can recalculate it. It's, just, it's really simple, just run exclusive OR again on the other two data blocks, and I can regenerate that drive. So that's how RAID 5 works. So that's Hamming codes. That was in the 50s. Then these guys came along in the 60s, and they changed everything. Uh, Gustav Solomon and Irving Reed. And these guys were staff members at the MIT laboratory. And 10 years after Hamming's paper, they published a paper called Polynomial Codes over certain finite fields. So I was reading up on this, and I suddenly realized that this was getting really mathematically complicated. Um, I'm not a mathematician, and I was out of my depth. So as I always do when I'm out of my depth, I um, go onto IRC and ask a question. So I did that. I went looking for the right IRC channel to, think, to ask in, thinking that this would be helpful. Um, I, I knew there was a bunch of mathematicians on this channel, so I just, um, I just asked, you know, can someone explain polynomial interpolation to me? <laughs> Um, this is the response that I got. <laughs> I don't know, maybe some of you understand what that, I, I, I have no idea. <laughs> but yeah, I, yeah, I, I um. Uh, I need to stop going to IRC for, as, a, as a resource. Um, the main idea behind Reed Solomon does, however, revolve around this concept of a Galois field. Uh, Galois field, it's named after Everest Galois, who was a French mathematician, and unlike our previous heroes, had a much more troubled and interesting life in the sense that he got interested in maths at the age of 14. He published a number of papers by the age of 17, of which one of them was about Galois fields and Galois theory. And this was a year after he was rejected from university because his examiner couldn't follow his train of thought and was very confused. He was politically active, ended up in prison a number of times before he engaged in a duel to the death with an officer at the age of 20 and died. So um, not the most glamorous of stories, but um, yeah, he did define this concept called the Galois field, which is basically uh, a mathematical field is a set of numbers which you can conduct mathematical operations on, and a finite field or a Galois field is one that is finite and is always the size of a prime number or prime power. And these fields wrap around, so you can conduct any operation on the values within the field and always get another value in the field. Um, and you do this, you can just modulate the size of the field um, once you get your results. So this can contain numbers, it can contain polynomials, and it can contain roots of po polynomials. And how does this relate to erasure coding and error correction? Well, um, the idea is that using a Galois field, you can essentially plot any sequence of data as points on a polynomial graph. Um, and that's because the graph itself is representative of the Galois field that you're using. Once you've done that, you can then find other points on the graph which you can use as parity data. So the purple ones are other points that we found on the same graph. 
And that's what we will use as our code shards. And the idea is that you define a code and you use that on both sides to recover data. And it's highly efficient, but much more com computationally ex expensive. So here's an example. Uh, K is the number of data shards that we have. M is the number of code shards. On the left, we have what's called a distribution or generator matrix, which is made up of an identity matrix at the top, uh, which is essentially is um, equivalent to one. And then the bottom piece is the uh, code shards, which we, we generate. Um, so we add them together, and we multiply that by our data, and we end up with a set of data and a set of uh, parity blocks. Um, so let's say we lose some of our data the, the bit in K. Uh, we can replace those with C1 and C2, which are uh, what, we, what we ended up calculating, and we can multiply that by the inverse of the same generator matrix that we have, and that will give us our data blocks back. And obviously, that's far more efficient than using something like um, uh, the Hamming codes. So this is really, really popular. Um, it's one of the most popular error correction codes we use today. And it's, it's seen everywhere, including CDs, DVDs. Um, you can, you, it's used in 2D barcodes as well. So um, any, any 2D barcode that you scratch or is damaged can still scan because it's using Reed Solomon to recover from um, that damage. And it's also used for generating QR codes. So most implementations of RAID 6 also use Reed Solomon as well. So this image is taken from the um, Rage Coding Docs in Ceph. And it's specifically for K equals 3 and M equals 2. So two parity shards for every three data shards. So in Ceph, when you create a new pool, um, you specify if you want it to be erasure coded or not, and also which erasure coding algorithm you want to use. Uh, Ceph has a pluggable architecture for erasure codes, so you can specify which code you want to use on a pool by pool basis. Once you've chosen uh, an erasure code, you can't then change it for that pool because you'd have to obviously recalculate everything. So um, you need to make sure the, the only way to do the only way to get around that you'd have to create another pool and migrate. So if you're going to use an erasure coded pool in product in production, you want to be sure that uh, you've chosen the erasure code that best suits your workload. Almost all of the erasure coding plugins within Ceph rely on some form of Reed Solomon. Um, there's a number of different varieties, though, with different strengths and weaknesses. Um, the main plugin that's used in Ceph is called J Erasure, and that has both uh, Vandermond and Couchy versions. Those are both versions of, of um, Reed Solomon, and they they, they differ just in how you generate the, the matrix at the beginning. Um, there's also some more recent propositions. Um, there's one called the shingle erasure code, and that aims to be more configurable and more efficient. There's also an implementation called clay, which focuses on reducing network bandwidth. And there's one called locally repairable codes, which specifies a, another variable called L. So you can say, I want my parity blocks to be stored in a specific geolocation. Uh, which helps us recover um, from erasure, er erasure coding damage, but without straining the network too much if we have a geo-replicated multi-site Ceph cluster. Um, so yeah, the key thing to remember is choose the right numbers for K and M. Uh, obviously, depending on how much storage you want to um, use, how much it's going to cost you in storage, and um, also pick the right... Um, erasure coding plugin once you've done some testing uh, with your workload. So you, you, you know that it, obviously it's a, it's a kind of more final choice. So how does this relate to our work at SoftIron? Well, we're working on building Ceph appliances, and there's lots of operations that we want to do in Ceph, which are computationally expensive. Compression, erasure coding, and encryption are all examples of this. So we're working on defining some of these algorithms in hardware so that we can use FPGAs to do the heavy lifting for us. And Keep, keep our CPU usage to just, just Ceph. So yeah, that's, that's my talk. Anyone have any questions? No mathematicians in the room, I guess. I read that performance was... Uh, <laughs> I read 
performance was really different between the K and M you choose. Mm -hmm. um, I read it um, should be multiple of two, or maybe something. Uh, can you explain why and which combinations may be the best? Um, so I think the, the most commonly... Uh, so the question is, what combinations of K and M are best and how do they um, affect performance within Ceph? Um, so typically we see... Um, people using 6K and, th and 3 for M or 9 and 4. Uh, those are the most commonly used ones. Uh, we're only implementing a few different combinations on our FPGAs for that exact reason because th th each one is going to be different how you define it in hardware. So I think there's a standard set that are used. Um, and yes, if you try and uh, do it with less M, then you're going to have to do... It's going to be much more expensive to calculate... The, n the number of M as a proportion. So you want to use a ratio of about 3 to 1, I think. Kuhn. How does the distributive nature of SEP affect the acceleration? Well, I, I imagine there's network latency. Yes, there is la network latency. Um, so there is heavy network latency in SEP, and that means that... Uh, oh, so the, the question is, how does it affect... Um, how does the distributed nature of Ceph affect um, acceleration? Uh, so there is network latency in Ceph, and that means that in some cases, the, uh, the cost of going to recover the data um, in time might be uh, still far less than the, uh, the expense of doing the replication of the network anyway. So you kind of have to have a bit of a cost balance and figure out in which cases it might be worth not accelerating the process, in which cases it might be worth accelerating. So it, it's, it's a trade-off. And I think in some cases it is, some cases it isn't. And that's a very important factor in deciding whether or not to accelerate. Does that answer your question? Yes. Cool. <laughs> OK. Well, thank you very much.